All right. Well, welcome back once again to another exciting episode of X-Ray Education. And today's topic is digital imaging. And in particular, we're going to be hitting some high spots that are going to be on your ARRT registry examination. And this is going to be review almost entirely. Um, if there's anything new on here, um, you, you might want to go to your books and just double check and make sure you understand how it works. Um, okay. There we go. All right, now we're in business. Okay, a little quick review here. Uh, metric system. Some people aren't too terribly hip on the metric system. I don't know why. We've been studying this since 1976, at least. So when people talk about centimeters, one centimeter is one one hundredth of a meter. Um, you know, it's pretty small. It's like, a, what, less than half an inch. Um, one millimeter is one one thousandth of a meter. And one micrometer is equal to one one millionth of a meter. It's really, really small. Now, a lot of times micrometers are expressed as microns. People talk about something being like 20 microns in size. Well, that's a micron is a micrometer. And these units are extremely small. Now, some other nomenclature that you may see is the Greek letter mu used in front of an M, and that means micrometer, as opposed to MM, which is just shorthand for millimeter. And the reason I'm going through these is because we're going to be using them over and over again during the course of this presentation. Now a little bit about spatial resolution. Spatial resolution is um, the minimum size of an object that we can visualize using this particular imaging system. Every imaging system has a spatial resolution value associated with it, and this hinges on your pixel size. The smaller the pixels are, the higher the spatial resolution. And you can think about, if you've seen, um, you know, like some television sets, and you know how some of them are 480p, 720p, 1080, and now we've got the 4K TVs. Well, the difference between those primarily is the size of their pixels. Um, the 1080p has significantly smaller pixels than the 480 did, and the 4K TV has very small pixels. You have to get really close up on the screen in order to be able to see those pixels. And we have a 4K TV down in our laboratory that we use to display images on, and uh, the resolution's very high. Now keep in mind, the human, the human eye can only see objects down to about 200 micrometers. So if something's smaller than that, we really can't see it too well unless we have a magnifying glass or something. Um, and most CR and DR systems can image down to about 140 micrometers. That's um, you know pretty much all the major players now are using uh, around 140 micrometer on a side is the, the dimension of their pixels. Um, some a little bigger, some a little smaller. And uh, screen film. Screen film has uh, really good spatial resolution. It can get down to about 50 micrometers, and with direct exposure film, we can get as fine as 10 micrometers. Um, you know, so that's about 100 line pairs per millimeter, I think. Uh, some relative sizes for you. Copy paper, and we're talking about thinness here. Like if you're looking on the edge of a piece of just regular um, copy or notebook paper, that's about a hundred micrometers thick. A uh, dollar bill is made out of some thicker material. Those are typically about 200 micrometers, so about twice as thick as a regular piece of paper. Still very thin though. And plastic bags, okay, if you go to um, like the dollar store and they give you a plastic bag, uh, you know, sometimes these things are pretty flimsy. They might be as thin as like 12 micrometers, so they're, they can be very, very, um, very thin. And a heavy-duty plastic bag might be up to around 130 micrometers. That'd be like a heavy-duty trash bag. Um, some more terminology for you. Uh, pixels. Uh, picture element. Picture element is the smallest thing that a digital system can show um, because anything that's smaller than a pixel is just going to be represented as a pixel. And it'll use um, like averaging or 
uh, highest density or less density depending on what software you're using and how you've got your system set up. But the smallest object we can see is one pixel in size because below that we're just having to like extrapolate. A matrix is a two-dimensional array of pixels. This is important because everything that we see, um, a human being is a three-dimensional object, but when we take the x-ray, it's a two-dimensional representation. And when we show it on the computer monitor, it's also a two-dimensional representation. So our matrix is width by height. Um, that's just our, our array of pixels that we have to work with. Um, pixel size is the dimension of the pixel. Like I said, most of these things are about 140 microns per side. And as far as I know, all the manufacturers use square pixels. I don't think anybody's using a rectangular pixel. So if it's 100 millimeters, I'm sorry, 100 micrometers wide, it's going to be 100 micrometers tall. And pixel pitch is just the distance from the center of one pixel to the center of the next pixel. And a lot of times pixel pitch and pixel size are used um, interchangeably because with most systems there is no, obviously it can't be zero distance between um, one pixel and another, but it's very, very close to zero. These pixels are nestled up really tight to one another. And that's just so the resolution can be improved. Now, uh, line pairs per millimeter. This is a standard unit of measurement in digital imaging. Um, well, and really conventional imaging too. It's like, how do we tell if one system's got a better spatial resolution than another? Well, we take an image of a line pair per millimeter test tool, and then we examine it. Um, you know, we either zoom it or look at it under a um, magnifying glass, whatever, depending on the system that we've got. And a line pair is just a black line paired with a white line. So if we have um, we have a white line, a black line, a white line, a black line, and then we measure um, you know, how many of those we can fit into one millimeter. That gives us our line pairs per millimeter. Systems with high spatial resolution obviously can demonstrate a lot more line pairs per millimeter. And most systems now, CR systems and DR systems, are 2.5 line pairs or better. And I emphasize the or better because most of them um, are more like three and a half or four uh, line pairs per millimeter. So suppose that we did have a CR system and this particular system could resolve 2.5 line pairs per millimeter. Well, what's the size of the smallest object this system can demonstrate? So think for a minute about like a crack in a bone or a small um, lung nodule, something like that. How small of an object can we show? Well, doing a little mathematics, if each millimeter has two and a half pairs, that means, and remember, a pair implies two. That means a, a white line and a black line. So that means we must have five pixels in each millimeter. If each millimeter does contain five pixels, then each pixel must be one-fifth millimeter in size. So one millimeter divided by five gives us um, 0 0.2 millimeters, which is equivalent to 200 micrometers. So since one pixel is the smallest thing we can represent, the smallest object we can image with this particular system would be an object 200 by 200 micrometers. In other words, something that was as small as a dollar bill is thick. So you think, well, you know, that's pretty small. And for a lot of general uh, diagnostic work, that's perfectly acceptable. Now, when we're looking at when we're looking at human tissue, we need to be able to see details like the trabecular patterns of bones, um, like tiny cracks, tiny uh, areas of calcification. The more detail that's present in the tissue, the higher the resolution that's required. So remember, no digital system can image an object smaller than one pixel in size. So primary um, purpose of the system must be taken into account when the initial purchase is made. Because if you buy a system that can resolve three and a half line pairs per millimeter, and then later you decide you need to be able to see five line pairs per millimeter, well, you know, tough. You're going to have to go out and buy another system. 
But if you're doing just, uh, say you've got a doctor's office and you're just doing like lumbar spines and chest and abdomen, um, knees, you know, stuff like that, depending on your clientele, then um, a less expensive system might be very attractive because you don't necessarily need to see microcalcifications or cerebral arteries. Um, and the higher the spatial resolution of a system, I guarantee you the higher the cost is going to be. Um, pixel pitch, I've got a little picture here that I grabbed from somewhere. Pixel pitch is the distance from the center of one pixel to the center of the next pixel. And, you know, there, there's um, some lines in between there, uh, but in most systems now, those lines are, are very, very thin. They figured out ways to get these pixels extremely close together. Um, light spread function. Any system that uses a scintillator, and most of the DR systems do. In other words, they, um, they have an indirect conversion process where when the incident photon interacts with the image receptor, first it hits a scintillating layer, um, something like uh, uh, amorphous silicon, um, or uh, I'm sorry, cesium iodide, or gadolinium, uh, the x-ray photon hits, it gives off light, and then that light is picked up by a photoconductor that's underneath the um, scintillating layer. Okay, and here's an image that I just pirated out of a book, and it just shows um, a little comparison here, and this is a cartoon depiction, so kind of take this with a grain of salt. But as you can see, if we have um, a CR system with turbid phosphors, then when the uh, laser hits this and it generates a light signal, the distance here between the phosphor and, and uh, you can think of this as an image intensifier, but the, the distance there is not zero. So the light has an opportunity to spread prior to being detected. And so there's a significant light spread function. The amorphous silicon is the photoconductor here. Cesium iodide in a needle, um, like a columnar phosphor here. And that helps contain some of that light spread. So we get more resolution with a system like this. Now, in theory, the best resolution would be obtained by a system that used amorphous selenium. Amorphous selenium is a really cool um, material. And what it can do is pick up x-ray photons and make a conversion directly from x-ray to uh, electrical signal, you know, by picking up those ionizations. Now, there's no light spread involved here. Amorphous selenium is a direct conversion process, and since there is no light spread, the spatial resolution is very high. The unfortunate thing is uh, selenium is a relatively low atomic number substance and so in order for it to be a, an efficient absorber of x-ray photons it has to be thick and even if you make it thicker it's still not that efficient so we might need to um, you know use more mass so therefore the exposure to the patient may not necessarily be worth the increase in um, spatial resolution now uh, contrast resolution different than spatial resolution this is the ability of any digital system to demonstrate adjacent shades of gray. The gray scale is also referred to as the dynamic range, and we talk about that a little bit later in this presentation. Um, just keep in mind for the time being, the dynamic range for CR and DR systems is at least 1,024 shades of gray. Um, most systems now uh, can show much more than that. Human beings with good eyes, I'm not talking about somebody with presbyopia like me, I'm talking about a, a young person with good functional eyes, they can see about 30 shades of gray at a time. And, you know, so you think, well, why do we need thousands of shades of gray if we can only see 30? Well, with window level and width adjustment, you can see more of the spectrum. So, yeah, you can only see about 30 shades at a time, but by window leveling, you can adjust which part of the spectrum you're looking at and so you can um, actually see a lot more with digital than you could with film screen. 
Now, as the bit depth increases, in other words, if we have a 10, 12, 16 bit depth, there's going to be more data and it's going to require more processing time, but the trade off there is higher contrast resolution. And nowadays, our computers are so strong, they're very powerful. You know, they can do like, um, you know, many, many transa transactions per second. And so our computers can process some very detailed images in just a matter of seconds. KVP, I wanted to mention this because in uh, some textbooks you'll read that KVP is completely detached from um, contrast using digital systems. That's mostly true. With digital processing, um, the computer, the algorithm we're using, has a lot more impact on contrast than KVP does. However, we've shown in the laboratory that as we adjust our KVP, um, you know, we, we don't see huge changes in our image, but we do see some. So KVP is mostly, but not completely detached from contrast. So keep in mind, as you're increasing your KVP, which I am totally a proponent of, by the way, I, I like using the highest possible KVP, it will impact your contrast, but not significantly. That's what I really wanted to say there. And keep in mind this. Across the spectrum of diagnostic imaging, contrast resolution trumps spatial resolution. So if you have one system that has a, a lower spatial resolution, but a higher contrast resolution, then that's going to be very, uh, it's going to give you a lot of diagnostic image, imaging, uh, a lot of diagnostic information. And this applies not only to radiography, but also to CT, MRI, and ultrasound. You might notice if you go and look at a CT scan, and you look at those images, and they're kind of small on the screen, and at first it looks like the image is, is nice and clear. But if you start zooming those CT images, you're going to see that they are pretty rough. Um, their spatial resolution is only like two line pairs per millimeter, something like that. Um, so they're pretty coarse. But the contrast resolution is off the chain. So bony anatomy especially looks beautiful on a CT scan. Uh, signal to noise ratio, SNR. This is one of those things that the, um, the registry wants you to know. Uh, signal to noise ratio is, um, okay, the signal is the part of the image that corresponds to your patient's anatomy. So if you're looking at, a, at an image of, say, a forearm, and you can see the radius and the ulna, and then around those you can also see the bands of muscle, um, and those are nice and clear. Okay, that's the actual anatomy. Noise is stuff like uh, quantum model, uh, basically anything that puts additional information on the imaging plate that does not correspond to anatomy. In other words, it's worthless from a diagnostic standpoint. All it does is just um, you know, help make it uh, harder for us to see our patient's actual physiology. So images with high signal to noise ratio appear very clear and with good resolution. Uh, contrast resolution and apparently spatial resolution. I mean, it, it's going to look more pleasing. And no matter what imaging system you're looking at, noise always compromises your resolution. Now, less noise on your image means higher signal to noise ratio and a clearer looking image. And where does the noise come from? Well, our old friend's quantum model. Uh, quantum model results of uh, when you use too little technique and your image is way underexposed and it has um, like a staticky television screen appearance. Uh, it's just really ugly. And with quantum model, there's really not much you can do about it. You can use smoothing sometimes to help the image look a little bit better. But usually if your image has too much quantum model, then it's compromised and you're going to have to reshoot. Now, structure model is something you may or may not have heard of. This is model that comes from the image receptor itself, and it just depends on what the manufacturer uh, used for their image receptor and how good their quality control is. So if you've got structure model, that's probably present on every image you take, and as long as it's not 
um, you know, outrageous, you probably never even notice it, but it's there. And then the other thing we have to worry about is scatter radiation. When we're using high KV techniques, then we're going to wind up generating scatter, and um, we either need to use a grid or a virtual grid to clean that up. But scatter is always present, no matter what. There's no way to 100% get rid of it. Um, image noise limits contrast resolution. It makes your picture look um, uh, look poor. Absolutely. Now, here's the thing. If you want to increase your signal to noise ratio, you can increase the mass. You can bump the mass up way high, and it's going to make your image look beautiful because increasing the mass tends to increase the signal to noise ratio. But your LARA principles must not be violated. If you're doing abdominal x rays and you're shooting those things at 80 or 100 mass on a normal size patient, the images probably look great. Uh, your exposure index is probably off the chain. It's going to be, um, you know, way high. We're not supposed to be doing that. Remember, as a radiographer, you're bound to try to get the best image you can with the least amount of radiation. Now, increasing the mass does not affect the spatial resolution, technically, but if you increase the mass and you increase the signal to noise ratio, it's going to make the image look like it's got improved resolution. But that's kind of like, a, what do you call it, almost an optical illusion. The spatial resolution, if you get down with a test tool and measure, you'll find that the resolution didn't really change, you just thought it did. And here's an image that has quantum models. See how fuzzy it looks? We either didn't use enough KVP or we didn't use enough mass. Now how can I tell? Well, I have to go back over to the control panel. If my control panel is set for 90 KVP, okay, well, I know 90 is plenty to penetrate a human skull, right? Um, so then I have to look at my mass readout. Um, maybe something's wrong with my AEC or I was doing a manual technique and maybe I only used like four mass or something like that and so I didn't have enough mass and so I can say okay KVP is fine I just need to increase my mass now vice versa wonder if I had you know I used like 12 mass but I only used 65 or 70 KVP well in that case I don't really don't need to add more mass I need to adjust my KVP because I'm not getting penetrated through the skull like I need to so go back and look you know whenever you've got quantum model don't just automatically kick up the mass because the mass may not be the issue. Look at your control panel and see, um, and it takes a little bit of intuition and experience, but just look and make sure that your KVP and mass both are numbers that make sense. Okay, CNR, contrast to noise ratio. What this is, is a measure of the differences between adjacent um, areas of the x-ray, you know, like one light and one dark, and you can see where one stops and one starts. Um, but you also control for noise. So remember, if you've got noise on your x-ray, that's going to compromise your contrast. So better CNR equals better contrast. This applies mostly to CT and MRI, but um, you're also going to see it uh, related to just flat radiography. So remember, contrast and noise ratio. This is your contrast controlled for uh, noise, and noise includes mostly scatter and quantum model. Modulation transfer function, the MTF. Now, uh, just a little bit of background here. MTF is kind of an old terminology. Um, it harkens back to the early days of radio when they were trying to make radio signals as clear as possible. They wanted the music in the studio to um, be reflected as nearly as possible in people's radios. So they worked and figured out how to make better microphones and better transmitters and better receivers and better speakers. They were constantly trying to improve it so that you couldn't really tell the difference um, between if you were in the room with the musician or if you were in the room with your radio. Now we use MTF in uh, digital x-ray and what we're doing here is we're comparing the image that the radiologist is looking at on his screen with the latent image that we took in the x-ray room and we want what the radiologist sees and no matter where he is um, sometimes your radiologist might be in India or Pakistan or someplace um, we don't 100% know but wherever they are we want the image they're looking at 
to be as close as possible to the image that we took. Um, an MTF, a modulation transfer function of 1.0, would mean that we didn't lose any signal at any point in the imaging chain. Um, that would be a perfect image, and that is impossible. Um, the accuracy of the recorded image is determined by the MTF of the system, and a lot of stuff figures in. Um, okay, how good is your image receptor? Uh, how good is your x-ray tube? How small of a focal spot do you have? You know, because that has an effect on how accurate the latent image is. And then we got to go from the latent image through an analog to digital converter, which means going to a computer. Then we're going to be stored on the computer's hard drive. Then we're going to be transmitted across the internet to the doctor's office. Then the doctor's going to pull up his um, image on his screen and he's going to look at it and wonder if he's got a really crappy terminal. Okay, we could have the best imaging system in the world, and if the doctor is reading off of a bad computer monitor, then the MTF is going to be poor. So just keep in mind, that's how the MTF works, and uh, in case anybody asks you about it, which they are liable to. Okay, dose. When we went from film to CR and DR, we should have seen a decrease in patient dose. But instead, what happened? We started pushing up the mass. And at first, we thought that that was what we were supposed to do because we didn't have any idea what the S number meant. And so we didn't know we were overexposing these patients. Um, you know, and the people that installed the equipment, they didn't really tell us too much about it. As a matter of fact, some of the early um, reps, you know, that were going around installing CR and DR systems, they said, yeah, you know, whenever you're taking your image, you just want to bump your mass up, you know, just increase it by. 25 or 50 percent, something like that. So they kind of encouraged us to increase the mass, and so we wound up, um, you know, instead of using less mass for these images, we use more. And why wouldn't we? Because we didn't know any better, and the images look great at high mass. Here's another image. Uh, Stuart's going to kill me. I'm just ripping him off wholesale here. Um, I've got experiments like this that I have done in our laboratory. But, um, you know, I don't have them uh, like a really good JPEG of all the images together. So I'm using this. Anyway, what I'm wanting to point out here is this. On the top row, we're using film screen. And we're going from 1.6 mass up to 25 mass and uh, using 70 kVp the whole way. And as you can see, we go from just white, you know, very high contrast image. And then at the high end, we have a, an image that is somewhat overexposed and with, uh, well, I guess the contrast is okay, but, but it's definitely a little dark around the edges. Um, probably the, the image we took at 12 mass was the better one. If you look at the bottom row, we go from 2.5 mass all the way up to 80 mass with no significant increase in density and no significant change in contrast or anything. You know, the, the images all look good. As a matter of fact, I would say, if I had to, you know, put my two cents worth in here, I'd say the image we took at 40 mass looks really good. That's totally irresponsible. You don't shoot any x-rays at 40 mass. At least I hope you don't. If you're doing that, please stop. Okay, exposure with DR. Underexposure is probably going to yield excessive noise. So if you don't use enough technique, if you're not penetrating that patient, you don't have enough KV or mass, then you're going to have underexposure and quantum model, and that's going to need repeated. An optimal exposure is a good image, and you used just enough technique. You know, you shot an x-ray of the knee, and you used 80 KVP and 2 mass, and it's beautiful. That's Olara. Now, once we start getting overexposed, if we're overexposing our patient, the images look good, but the patient's getting too much dose, so we should not be doing that. Look at your image, um, look at your image, and also look at your exposure index, and make sure that the EI is not getting out of control. If you're using gross overexposure, like if you're using four or five times too much energy for your X-ray, then you're probably going to wind up degrading your contrast. Um, you know, so your image, the, the computer can only do but so much to make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. So you're probably going to wind up, um, you know, with a 
like a washed out looking image even in post processing and then when you hit the saturation point that means you have burnt that image so bad that the computer can't figure out which pixel is which because they're all black and so you wind up with what I call black holes that you cannot fix by window width and level you know no matter how low you pull your window level you've still got a black spot right out there in the middle of your image don't do that so when you're out in the field and you're shooting x-rays don't repeat an x-ray because of contrast or brightness issues unless it's way out of bounds you know just notate that you use too much or too little um, technique and, and keep that in mind for your next exposure DR systems cannot compensate for quantum model noise so you want to use enough mass and KV in order to avoid quantum model but you don't want to use too much because that's just irresponsible and overexposed images don't necessarily need to be repeated but that shouldn't become a habit but I, I understand the temptation because overexposed images do look pretty okay a little bit more about spatial resolution um, in CR spatial resolution was and it still is controlled by pixel size but um, with CR we had a scanner uh, we, we had a laser scanner inside of our reader and so the spatial resolution was affected by the diameter of the laser beam and the ADC uh, so you know there were some more things figuring into the uh, pixel size there keep in mind your focal spot plays a definite role you can tell regardless of your image receptor you can tell a big difference between large and small focal spot exposures um, the resolution the spatial resolution is not really related to the exposure sometimes it looks like it is but it really isn't and with CR the primary controller of pixel size well that was the ADC that was the primary controller with DR what is the primary controller yeah that's exactly right the the Dell the detector element your pixel size can never be smaller than the dimension of your detector element and you can pause this and study it if you wish um, I just wanted to compare this was some stuff that Fuji was doing back in the day I'm not sure if they still do this or not I haven't really looked into it because you know nobody's really using CR that much anymore but um, the original CR system that we had from Fuji we had a different um, resolution going from 14 by 17 to 10 by 12 to 8 by 10 so for extremities we would use our 8 by 10 CR plates and we would pick up a little more um, spatial resolution okay a little bit more on contrast resolution um, image response curve is a straight line with DR systems and so image contrast is not as closely related to KVP as it once was um, KV has some effect but not a real significant one so this allows us to do something really cool we can boost the KVP and reduce the mass which improves our patient's exposure and with a DR system we still maintain our image contrast you know you're not going to blow your contrast um, like on a hip x-ray some people are hesitant to kick the KVP up to 90 or 100 because they think they're going to mess up their contrast you won't image is going to be pretty so try to use as high a KVP as you can for all exams as long as you got sufficient penetration through that tissue the computer will take care of the contrast for you and then the doctor in post-processing can adjust the contrast any way he wants to one minor caveat though before we uh, continue on from this although with CR and DR systems the KV and contrast are mostly decoupled using a high KV technique can possibly result in too much scatter so even with a grid the image can look foggy so push the KVP but be mindful of excess scatter so you're gonna run into this when you get up around 110 120 KVP that's when you're gonna have an issue with scatter radiation and this is just a D log E curve that I again pirated out of Stewart's book sorry I guess I should draw my own 
Okay, DQE, Detective Quantum Efficiency. This is just a measure of how sensitive your particular image receptor is to X-rays, the absorption efficiency. So a system with high DQE doesn't need very much X-ray in order to make an image. So like some of those new uh, Shimadzu plates that are coming out, you can shoot chest X-rays at like 1.5 mass and still have a, a really good looking image because they have such high DQE. And um, CR has a higher DQE than film by far, you know, significantly higher. But then DR came along and was more sensitive than CR. So when you're using a DR image plate to do like portable chest x-rays, you should be able to shoot those at like 110 kvp and 2 mass and have a good looking image. So less dose is required to form an image, so the patient dose should go down. Um, the DQE of flat panels, um, generally we have two different scintillator configurations and this depends on the manufacturer and how much money you've got to spend. A cheaper DR detector is going to have what's called a turbid phosphor. This is gadolinium oxysulfide, a thin layer of it, it has a relatively lower DQE, um, also doesn't have as good of um, uh, spatial resolution. Now the columnar phosphors, those needle phosphors um, that cesium iodide forms, those tend to have higher detective quantum efficiency, so they're sensitive, there's less light spread and higher resolution. But, you know, so you're thinking, why would anybody buy a turbid phosphor system if they can get the cesium iodide system? Well, it depends how much money you got. Uh, you might get a turbid phosphor system for like 20, 25,000 bucks, you know, so that's a temptation. Okay, and here's another picture that just shows kind of how the detector elements are laid out. And every, as far as I know, every DR system there is uses glass as a backing material for their, um, for their amorphous silicon or gadolinium, you know, whatever their um, detector's made of, they all use glass. And that's why you have to be so careful. If you drop a DR imaging plate and that glass cracks or, you know, worse yet shatters, then that plate is gone. Gone, baby, gone. And there's nothing anybody can do about it. It just has to be replaced. So don't drop those things. And I wanted to show you, okay, now this is just a cartoon capture element. It wouldn't be rectangularly shaped. Um, but the capture element doesn't take up the whole um, pixel here. There's this thin film transistor, and I'm going to say a little bit more about those in just a minute. But um, this is kind of how, and if you see around the periphery of the DR, there are a bunch of microprocessors. And these microprocessors all work together to, um, each one's responsible for a column or a row. And those guys, um, they basically collate their data together very, very quickly and then build an image and display it. And since all these processors are working simultaneously, our um, image time, I think some systems now are down to about five seconds from the time you make the exposure until the time the, the image appears on your monitor. Very quick. Especially when you consider how much data is going through there. With all flat panel systems, the size of the detector element, the DEL, controls the spatial resolution. And when we talk about these systems, we say DEL. Um, that's just a, a shorthand way of saying detector element. Now I wanted to make a little mention here of um, the fill factor, because you'll see that on the registry. And the fill factor is just that area of the detector, or the area of the pixel, um, the detector element that's actually sensitive to x-rays. So if an x-ray comes in here and it hits the storage capacitor, then it doesn't count. If it hits the thin film transistor, it also doesn't count. It has to hit somewhere in the detector area in order for the computer to be able to, to see the, that a photon actually hit here. And let me tell you a little bit about TFTs. Um, because there is a lot of misconception about these things. 
A thin film transistor. A transistor is a device that can either transmit or resist an electric current. So the TFT is an electronic switch. It's like a gate. So whenever we take an image and we're generating electrons because of um, ionization events on the detector, well, those electrons are stored in the storage capacitor. They can't go anywhere until we pull this TFT. We have to send an electrical signal to the TFT that says, okay, I need you to open up and let me know how many electrons you're holding back. And these uh, detector elements have to be pulled one at a time by their respective microprocessors so that we know where on the matrix the signal came from and how strong it was. And if we know those two things, if we have a signal strength and we have a location, then we know how to paint that pixel, either light or dark or some other shade of gray. Um, I'm just going to say a little bit about CCD-based systems because most of the major players now are getting away from this. Uh, CCD was some of the first um, direct capture type systems and what these things did uh, they had a scintillator plate which would emit light whenever it got hit by x-rays and behind that plate was a digital camera or um, an array of digital cameras and the idea was just as the scintillator lit up you know it received the signal and it lit up with like an image of a chest and at that same instant the CCD would take a snapshot of that um, scintillator and then convert that into an image, right? Um, and it worked. The advantage of CCD plates is that they're serviceable. If, um, if it stops working, then somebody can come in and take that thing apart and see what's wrong with it. Um, you know, it's modular, it can be fixed. As opposed to direct capture systems that cannot be fixed. You know, if they break, then they're just dead, Jim. The Nyquist frequency. Okay, Nyquist theorem says that if you want to have five line pairs per millimeter, then you need to sample at least 10 pixels per millimeter in order to make that happen. So the Nyquist frequency is one half the pixel density. Um, and that's really, I was talking to uh, Barry Burns at UNC back in the day, and I was, um, you know, we were talking about Nyquist, and I said, hey, you know, is it really this simple? He said, yeah, that's all there is to it. Um, it just in indicates the, the best spatial resolution that a given system is capable of showing. And you keep in mind this, for and this isn't all that important anymore, I guess, because CR systems are going by the wayside, but for CR systems, the actual resolution is only about 70% of your Nyquist. So if you've got a system that says it can do five line pairs per millimeter, you're probably only going to get about three and a half out of it because of the line or light spread function um, robbing us of our spatial resolution. Okay, a little math problem for you. You can pause at this point if you want to. Suppose that a system needs to be able to demonstrate structures down to 50 microns in size. How many pixels per millimeter are required and how many line pairs per millimeter does this, um, is this, is this gonna show? Okay, you can pause it, do your math, or you can just uh, go on with me as I explain it to you. Okay, so our requirement, we need to see a 50 micron object. Remember that 50 microns is equal to 0 0.050 millimeters. We have to move the decimal place uh, three places when we're converting from microns to millimeters. And, but we need to convert to millimeters so we can do this math. So we've got one millimeter divided by 0 0.050, which is the size of each uh, pixel. And so that's going to give us 20. So we need 20 pixels per millimeter in order to be able to see a 50 micron object. So this means we need 10 line pairs per millimeter. And this is um, not atypical for digital mammography systems. It's very atypical for digital diagnostic systems. I mean, this would be nice, but I can't imagine how much money it would cost to get a 17 by 17 DR plate that could do 20 pixels per millimeter. I imagine the cost would be high. 
Um, spatial frequency. Spatial frequency is expressed in line pairs per millimeter and this is just a convenient way for us to um, compare systems. So if company A comes up and they say well my system can show six line pairs per millimeter and company B says well my system can show seven line pairs per millimeter that might figure into my purchase decision. Um, question, what is the spatial frequency of a 100 micrometer object? five line pairs per millimeter. So I'll let you do the math. Um, I'm pretty sure my figures are accurate. Spatial resolution. Okay, a certain CR system can image at most six line pairs per millimeter. What is the size of the smallest structure that it can show? Okay, so I've told you that my system can do six line pairs per millimeter. That means that this thing can have, it can show 12 pixels per millimeter. So if I've got 12 pixels per millimeter, then how big is each pixel? Hopefully you've got a calculator that works and you're going to figure out that 12 pixels per millimeter implies that uh, each pixel is about 83 microns in size. So that's the smallest thing we can image. This would be extremely good resolution. If I had a system that could do six line pairs per millimeter, I would never complain about that. Most of our systems can only do about three and a half. And I've got a new DR system in my lab. It's only about six months old. And that thing can only do about 3.6 line pairs per millimeter. I mean, it's a good system, there's no doubt. But it doesn't have anywhere near six line pairs per millimeter resolution. We've tested it, you know, so we know exactly what it can do. Um, dynamic range. Okay, how many shades of gray can your system show? Uh, digital systems typically start responding when they pick up a signal of about 100 micro rad or micro Rankin. So they're very, very sensitive. So if my, my lightest shade of gray is going to be picked up there, um, you know, then how many more shades of gray can I display? Well, it depends on your dynamic range and how many bits you devote to um, each pixel. So if I've got a system with 12-bit dynamic range, how many shades of gray can it show? Well, you can quickly figure that out. Um, the number of shades of gray is 2 to the n, where n is equal to the number of bits we're using for each pixel. So modern systems, almost all the systems that we have now are, um, they use 16 bits and if you take 2 to the 16th power you're going to see that that's equal to over 65,000 shades of gray. That's a lot of shades of gray and you know keep in mind we can only see 30 at a time. Now for a 12-bit system which uh, the Fuji CR system was 12-bit but like I said I think almost all the manufacturers now have gone to 16 but if you do have a 12-bit system, that can show 4,096 shades of gray, which is just 2 to the 12th. Um, a little bit about automatic rescaling. Uh, the registry wants you to know about this. All CR and DR systems do this. Um, what they do is they take your initial image and, they, and the computer looks at either the region of interest, if you've got a collimated field, or if it can't figure out where your collimation is, it just uses the whole panel typically and it examines it and it comes up with um, an idea of how dark or light this image is and then it tries to fix that. It wants to put the image into a pleasing visual range, um, which for humans is about 1.5 optical density units. Um, I know that's kind of old school, but take my word for it. Anyways, the the system says okay I'm gonna give the I'm gonna give a preliminary adjustment to this image to either darken it up or lighten it up enough for my human user to be able to to see it and this all depends on the programmer that built the system programmers um, and this this is where your exposure index comes from Okay, brightness on an image. Brightness is relative to the x-ray signal. So the more x-ray hit that image, the lower the brightness is going to be. In other words, it's going to be dark. So if uh, you've got an area of film that's behind um, 
like a prosthesis. If somebody has a, a hip replacement or a knee replacement, something like that, the area behind that prosthesis is going to be very bright. It's going to be white. So less signal to the image receptor means higher brightness. So if we're looking at a film screen image, um, this is a very bright image over here. We would say low density. Um, the image in the middle looks a little bit better. Uh, the image over on the right is way too dark. We would say that that image had a high density. And if we take a look at uh, the same kind of thing done on a DR system or a CR system, here we go. Same images. We used 0.2 mass, 1.2 mass, and 6 mass. And remember how this one was all blacked out before? Now these things don't even look all that different, do they? The computer pretty much fixes it for us. It takes your you know, dark image and lightens it up. It takes the light image and darkens it up within limits. You'll notice that here in the hind foot, we have nothing. You know, no matter what, um, we, we raised our mass up to six, we still have no penetration here. And that's because we were using only 50 kVp. All right, a uh, little bit, I'm not gonna go into CT scanning here, but I did wanna show you how the scanogram works. Um, this is another form of DR. And what we do, um, whenever we're getting ready to do a scanogram, instead of spinning around and around the patient like it normally does, the x-ray tube is fixed in place and the detector array is fixed opposite. And so um, the x-ray comes on and the patient moves through the beam and it generates an image that looks something like this. Now, okay, I used to be a CT tech. I have never tried to do a whole body scan on somebody like this before. The biggest thing I ever did was a chest and abdomen, at least as far as I recall. Um, but anyway, this is kind of how a CT scanogram looks. And you'll notice that, okay, maybe the recorded detail is not all that great, but the contrast is amazingly good. I used to think, shoot, you know, instead of hassling with doing chest x-rays with regular x-ray, I could just put everybody on my CT table and just, um, you know, do a scanogram of the chest. I could get my AP and lateral right quick doing it that way. Okay, so in summary, digital imaging. Digital resolution is never going to be as good as film, but the trade-off is this. The contrast resolution is high. And in, in imaging, contrast resolution trumps spatial resolution. Spatial resolution is limited by our pixel size, either by the ADC's ability or the DEL size. And the DEL size, there's nothing you can do about it because once you've purchased an um, imaging plate, then it is what it is. You can't, uh, you can't make the DEL smaller than, than it was at the factory. Digital has a much wider dynamic range and better contrast resolution. And with digital imaging, because of the higher DQE, remember that's detective quantum efficiency, these systems are very sensitive to radiation. Improvements in patient dose reduction are possible. Just because you can shoot everything at 100 mass doesn't mean you should. Try to back that mass down as much as possible and increase the KVP and you'll be doing your patients all a huge favor. All right, thank you very much for your kind attention. I appreciate it. I'm sorry this went on so long. Um, and uh, happy x-ray radiography to everybody. I'll see you next time.